I wanted to bring you on to talk about specifically some of the challenges that perimenopausal and menopausal women face. And there are a, a plethora of verticals that we can talk about, but the two that I'd like to hone in on today is the changes that we see in our skin health and then the changes that we see in our musculoskeletal and musculoskeletal uh, system. So yeah. let's start with skin. And I wanted to start here because I am constantly asked what do I do for my skin? What is my skin routine? What is my morning routine? What is my evening routine? And I started off at the beginning of this year, really making a promise to myself to figure out what are some of the best products on the market that are going to give me literally the best skin ever. I want the best skin that I've ever had in my life. I'm 46. I'm almost 47. I want, I want to make this happen. And one of the products that has come into rotation and has stayed in rotation, very important point, <laughs> because lots of things have come in and then they've just gone right out because I didn't see any change. One of them that has come in is this skin serum. And we'll talk about some of these products that contain uh, urolithin A. So before we get there, let's talk about the changes for a menopausal woman, what does she see in her skin changes? Maybe we're talking about 40s. And then, of course, when she becomes menopausal at some point in her 50s. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, so many changes, right? It's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, you know, I just turned 49, right? So I'm sort of in the throes of perimenopause myself. And the more that I a, experience this and B, research it, the more I'm just sort of blown away by how much estrogen does for us, right? Like, yeah. unfortunately, I think so much of us were just taught about estrogen, progesterone, and it, not even testosterone necessarily, right? But that these are just like our regulators of our cycle, and that's all they do. And gosh, surprise, they do so much more. Um, but wait, there's more. And yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And so I just learned this, honestly, probably like uh, six months ago, our mitochondria have estrogen receptors on them, like mind blown, right? So hmm. clearly there's some link there, right? Between energy production and our mitochondria. And so a lot of the research I was diving into on that is a lot of it is in animal models and, and hasn't really shown, you know, we haven't seen actual evidence yet in humans on the role of sort of estrogen mitochondria, but there's definitely a link for sure. So in the skin, I think really the first thing that we start to see and Honestly, this is before even our hormones start changing, right? We start to see aging in our body, in all of our systems. It really starts to happen in our 30s. When we look at these biological hallmarks of aging, and this is outside of estrogen, which we'll, we'll dive into, a lot of these processes, these cellular changes that we see in our muscle, that we see in our skin, that we see in our immune system, they start much younger than we think. When I was in my 20s and thinking about aging, I was like, oh, I'll deal with that when I'm like 50. No, we should be thinking about that in our 20s and 30s and how we can then be in a much more healthy, advanced state when we turn 50. So estrogen and skin plays a number of roles, no surprise. So one of the things that it does is it helps with collagen formation. So one of the first things we start to see is the changes in fine lines and wrinkles. We start to notice that. And I think skin is kind of, it's you less know, unless plump. you throw out like your- it's less You push it and it, it doesn't quite bounce back <laughs> immediately. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that I notice, like I call them like my jowls, like a little like sagging, mm -hmm. you know, the little crow's feet are more pronounced. Yeah. And I even noticed that like, you know, when I used to use like creams and lotions and, and I also like have been in love with our skin care products as well. And it's really changed the way that I focus on my skin health. But, you know, when I was using sort of lower quality ingredients, like I would notice even those little like fine lines and wrinkles that used to plump when I put a moisturizer on, like by the end of the day, that was like, all that benefit was gone. So there's that, you know, elasticity, there's that glow, but there's also our skin. I think we, we forget this often is that our skin is an organ, right? And it has a job to do besides just how we look. So it is a barrier to environmental, you know, pathogens. So that skin barrier weakens as we get older. Our skin gets thinner. It bruises more easily. We, you know, if we get cut, it doesn't heal as easily. And all of these are tied to the declining estrogen that's happening, you know, in our skin cells and throughout our body. Yeah. And I, to your point, like I always call estrogen, it's the MVP for skin health, right? It's the collagen synthesis, as you, as you were saying, antioxidant defense, maintaining the mitochondrial health in the skin with the estrogen receptor, just to paraphrase uh, what you were, what you were just describing there. And then 
oil gland regulation as well. Like a lot of women will say that their skin just feels drier. And part of that's testosterone, right? Because we know testosterone upregulates the sebaceous glands, et cetera. You know, I have teenage boys, so I'm very, very they're they're very much surging testosterone and some of the yes. effects that that can have on their skin. So the declining testosterone and the declining estrogen for a woman often leaves her skin feeling very dry. Let's talk a little Dries. bit of, so that dryness and itchy. That's the other thing is very itchy. I yeah. was just going to say that too. You know, there's there's all sorts of like, I don't want to call them, let's call them uncommon symptoms that are still symptoms, right? So there's many women notice dryness, but other women start to notice acne happening at this point in their, in their um, transition. Mm. Itchy skin, I hear that so often. And just sensitivity, like skin that didn't used to be sensitive, just feels very sensitive to products or that's something I've just even noticed. Like I will wake up and just sometimes I'm like, my skin feels more sensitive today. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. It's a little more red. It's a little more pinkish. It just feels a little raw. Yeah. And so the skin is going to now lose its ability to retain moisture, right? If it's feeling very dry, very itchy, a lot of women will say their ears get very itchy, which I think is very interesting as well. Sensitivity, as you mentioned. And then the other thing is hyperpigmentation or just uneven pigmentation. I have a little bit of that from, you know, worshiping the Italian sun, <laughs> you know, sort of along the, along the cheeks, a little bit of darkness kind of along the, along the, the bone that still thankfully covers up with a little bit of tinted sunscreen, but still noticing like that uneven pigmentation, elasma for some women, where and why is that happening for women in perimenopause and menopause? So I think, you know, there's two things to remember, right? One is that part of that also is due to the changes in hormones, right? As we, you know, women who were pregnant, a lot of women notice also melasma, dark spots happening mm -hmm. as their hormone levels surge and change. The other thing that we also have to remember is that, you know, we're in our 40s and our 50s and we're also now seeing the accumulation of sun damage, which is actually the number one cause of skin aging. So 80% of our skin aging isn't really from, it, I think because we go through a bit of a drastic change in our hormones, it feels like everything is happening at once. Mm. But 80% of skin aging is really from the damaging effects of our environment. And so then when you kind of add that on to the changes that are happening with estrogen, it really starts to feel like an accelerated process. So a lot of those dark spots may also just be you know, we, we I'm in your same age, same age group, right? I was out there with the reflectors and the baby oil. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's also just the sun damage is now really starting. to. And so how can we, let's tie this back to urolithin A. So these are some of the changes that we see in menopause. Why is urolithin A significant here for skin health? What are some of the proposed benefits that we can either through, and you can re, you can tell me if it's uh, better to orally, you know, to take urolithin A as a supplement or to topically apply it to the skin, maybe it, both. What are some of the benefits of urolithin A in terms of mitigating or attenu to, you know, improve some of these skin-related changes that we see in menopause? That is really the secret to the success here. Um, so it is making mitochondria we're able to recycle them, revamp them, surge up the energy that's happening inside the cell. And the way to really best do it is topically. Now, we, you know, there first was an oral supplement that was on the market and feedback, even though it wasn't studied for skin, feedback was happening like, wow, my skin starts to, is starting to look better. And so that really prompted this idea of like, well, can we, you know, does it work topically? It, different mechanism of action, which obviously will, will, clear up. But kind of I think of it as like vitamin C, right? We know we have to eat vitamin C. It's an antioxidant. We know it has benefits when we consume it internally. But we also know that vitamin C makes a really potent topical. Yeah. It's localized on the skin. And that's how I think of urolithin A. So we are looking at doing a study that would actually look at a benefit from doing both the dietary supplement and the skin. And personally, that's where I think the best bang for your buck is going to come because you're targeting, you know, the entire body and you're targeting sort of all layers of the skin that way. But for the quick, localized, potent skin benefits, it's going to be with a topical application. And that's where, you know, our development, our skin line really looked at doing high quality research on the topical application of urolithin A. So yeah. the skin, the, the dietary supplements, 
we don't have as much research yet in terms of skin, great research in other parts of the body. Yeah. And it would be interesting if the study, if you are designing studies and taking suggestions, which I'll just give my two cents. Yeah, if you, we always are. So if you if you have the, the one that you just described, which is supplementation and the topical, it would also be nice to see just the topical compared with that group. And then just mm-hmm. the supplementation compared with that group, and then either a placebo or a nocebo compared with all of them to see if there's any. And that is a very expensive, I recognize <laughs> that is a very expensive study to run, but that would be really interesting to know if it's do we need to be exot, like applying it topically and then taking the, the supplement internally? Does that give you a statistically significant? improvement over just the topical application? Can we just take the supplement? You know, if you're a supplement person and you just get in the habit, you go every day to your supplement closet and you take your supplements and the urolithin A is there and you just take it, you know, that's just the way you're going to do it. It will be interesting to be able to compare those groups. And then of course, to someone who thinks that they're taking something, but they're not. Yeah. That would be an interesting study for me to see because I love the analogy to vitamin C. And side note, I haven't found a really good vitamin C serum. So if you have recommendations, I'll take them. Mm-hmm. I find that they I, they just sit on my skin like and they get tacky. I don't I don't and know why. They smell funny. Yeah. I just, don't they smell funny to me? They smell funny. Uh, I I don't know. I'd rather see the lemon one that on I my love. face or something. I don't know. I just yeah. need I need a good vitamin C, which maybe maybe timeline can come up with one. I don't know. If I, that's, if that's I, in the pipeline. Well, but. we'll put it in the request. I know. I uh I you know, I think timeline's focus is to have urolithin A in everything, yeah. right? That's really because the power of it is so incredible. Um, but I don't, you know, maybe it's a vitamin C plus your listening serum. I'll put in a good word. Something, yeah, I want what, the study first. Let's let me just be, my priorities are is the supplement and the sure. topical, you know, arguably st- like t- statistically sig- significantly more giving you more bang for your buck than just one or the other. That would be my question. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I'm curious to see too is, you know, and 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 as we dive into the research, I think this will showcase the commitment to science that that timeline does is, you know, skin, sometimes that's very subjective, right? Like I think I look better or like my significant other told me I look better. And so the research that we do uses like, you know, high tech imaging and is actually like measuring, you know, wrinkle depth and wrinkle volume and is doing, you know, cellular studies. So it would be really interesting. Yeah. I think to have very concrete evidence to show, you know, because I think placebo, somebody might think it looks better. Right. Right. That would be a placebo effect. But right. I, I suspect we wouldn't actually see an improvement in wrinkle depth or see, you know, yeah. any of these genes that turn on, you know, mitochondrial health or collagen you know, production are upregulated. So 